Okay, hello everybody. Um, welcome to HMIS Project Setup 201 and 101. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, so we're just gonna be starting off with some introductions. So I'm actually gonna ask these people to introduce themselves. Is this one working? There we go. Hi everyone, I'm Meredith Alspa from the Partnership Center. You, she, her pronouns. Um, good to see all of you. Um, that's a little bit about me. If you don't know me already, I feel like it's one of those funny things where y'all know my face and like come say hi to me, which I love. And I'm always like, I don't know your name. But as soon as you say it, then I like, I get it. And I can equate it to an AAQ or some other conversation we've had, but apologies if I give you a strange look in advance. Um, so good to be here. Thank you all for joining us. And I think so Ryan next. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Ryan Berger. I use he, him pronouns. I am a HUD TA provider with ICF. Uh, I've been providing HUD TA for about eight years and have about 15 years total uh, experience in the HUD, COC, HMIS kind of homelessness space. Um, I live outside of the city of Pittsburgh, um, spent a lot of time uh, supporting the Pittsburgh Allegheny County continuum of care. Um, I want to thank Sam for the great idea of putting dogs on our intro slides. These are my two Australian shepherds, Leo and Rosa. I also have two kids, August and Violet, at home right now. So uh, great to be here with you all. I'm looking forward to our session today. Yeah, I'm just going to go back a slide and just point out Meredith's dogs as well. <laughs> um, my name is Samantha Kamiyama. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I used to be an HMIS admin before I was a homeless TA provider. Um, I live out of the western suburbs of Chicago, and when I'm not working, I like to cross-stitch and play video games, and this is my dog, Odin. So we would like to get an idea of who's in the room with us today, so we're just going to do like a quick raise of hands. I'm going to give you a quick um, second to read what the, um, the actual choices are. You can be multiple of these, you could be one of these, so HMIS lead, HMIS system admin, HMIS trainer, COC lead, CE lead, and community member. So who here is representing an HMIS lead? Great. Um, and then an HMIS sysadmin? Perfect. That's who we're expecting to be here. Um, HMIS trainer? Probably a lot of the same people that raised their hands previously. COC lead? Great. Um, CE lead? Coordinated entry? I see some people raising their hands for all of them. I hear you. A uh, community member. Great. And we will. We would also like to know um, how long have you been in your role? So have you been in your less than six months? Okay. Uh, six to 12 months. One to two years. Two to three years. And three plus years. Okay. Great. <laughs> Okay, um, then I th I'll pass it on to Meredith. Thank you. The fun task of, oh, our numbers are messed up on learning objectives. We have won six times. <laughs> Gosh. Um, okay, so we're hoping that today you'll get one thing out of this. Just one thing. <laughs> Um, you know, this is HMIS 101 and 201. Those of you that have been around for a while, we used to do these as two separate sessions. There was a lot of overlap. We got a lot of feedback from folks that, hey, why don't you just do one session? So we've combined them. Hopefully this is our first time of doing the combined session. Hopefully we struck the right balance, but it seems like there's quite a few new folks in here. So, um, you know, we will definitely be covering a lot of the fundamentals. So um, hopefully after this session, You'll have um, sort of a basic understanding, at least, of the project setup requirements, have a better understanding of HUD and their federal partner project setup requirements. So we're talking COC, ESG, backup, continuum of care program, emergency solutions program, uh, the housing opportunities for people with HIV AIDS, uh, the PATH program, partners in the assistance of transitioning out of homelessness. Did I get that right? Uh, the Runaway Homeless Youth Program, Veterans Administration Programs, and the Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program. So we're going to talk a little bit more about those. Um, some common challenges and solutions, hopefully, for some um, project setup questions, uh, some considerations when um, thinking about project setup and reporting. 
And then how to find resources, right? Like we always struggle with finding stuff. So we've put some links in the slides that hopefully will uh, help you out here. Okay, so I like this little decision tree. Uh, we won't spend too much time on it, but again, it's in the slides and it's been in our, our prior sessions of sort of thinking about setting up a project in HMIS and, and really liking this sort of first is the project a continuum project, meaning dedicated to serving people experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness in the case of like an ESG prevention project? Um, if yes, go this way. If no, go down. Um, we say sort of ingest, do whatever you want. Please don't just do whatever you want. <laughs> like if it's going in your HMIS, we want to have some level of, uh, you know, fidelity to the, to the system and some data quality and, you know, actually having some meaningful information in the system. Otherwise don't put it in HMIS. If you're going to put it in HMIS, follow some sort of rules, but you don't necessarily have to follow all of them. Um, do they meet the definition of homeless or at risk? If yes, are they served by uh, this project funded by a single source? If yes, set up a single project. If no, things start getting a little more complicated in your life and you move down here into are they eligible to be served by all the funding sources? If yes, you keep going. If no, tells you pretty clearly here, set up two different projects. And we're going to get into some of the weeds of these details here in a minute. Um, are all the sources serving all the clients? If yes, go on. Do they require additional uh, reporting? If no, set up one project. I'm a big fan of simplifying our lives. So if we can have one project and we just need to adjust our data sharing, we need to make some adjustments in our privacy and consent policies, let's look at how we can maybe do that instead of having clients go through multiple enrollments and multiple projects when we don't need to. So just something to think about. Um, again, I breeze through that real quick, but it is available in the slides and it is helpful to go back and look at as you're thinking about setting up your projects in HMIS. So let's start here with the bare bones fundamentals. I like to think of it as programs, components, projects. You've got programs. Those are your federal funding sources. That's your um, continuum of care, your emergency solutions, right? You've got your federal funding programs. And then under that, you've got components, which are the categories of funding provided by that program. So that's where you've got your permanent housing, your services only, uh, your HMIS. Those are different components available under that funding source. And then we get into the projects, which are the group of activities which provide services and or housing to the clients. So that's getting into your rapid rehousing project, your permanent supportive housing project. Um, sometimes things are both a component and a project. Street outreach is off a component um, under the emergency solutions grant program also a project type. But in the context of the HMIS materials that you'll find, we talk about things in program components and projects. So just wanted to sort of lay that as a foundation there to think about how we're going to talk about these things. So the next few slides, we're going to go through the different federal programs and talk about their components and project types. And then I just have a few sort of tips that I'll interweave in here, uh, commonly asked questions that we, we hear about a lot. Um, HUD has uh, the COC program, right? So with continuum of care program, that is the funding source. And we've got the different components, permanent housing component, supportive services only component, transitional housing, prevention, um, safe haven is a, a legacy program, and then the joint combo, transitional housing and permanent rapid rehousing. So you'll see on these slides, I've sort of organized it with the component and the project type. So when it is funded under a permanent housing component, it can only be one of those two project types, it can only be rapid rehousing, it can only be permanent supportive housing. And we'll talk about this more in reporting, but this is really going to come into play when it comes time to do your APRs, your annual performance report for the COC program, and your CAPERS, Consolidated Annual Performance and Evaluation Report, for Emergency Solutions Grant. So um, keep that in mind. Uh, just want to say a couple things on supportive services only. That is the component, but you'll see there's multiple project types under there, right? There's a coordinated entry project type, there's a services only, and there's a street outreach. So you can have a single program component, and multiple project types underneath. That's going to be um, really important for you to have, and I think Ryan gets into this, sort of an understanding of what the project was funded to do 
what did HUD fund that project? Yes, it's a services only, but is it a services only street outreach? Is it a services only coordinated entry? Uh, you as HMIS leads, as HMIS admins, having uh, those relationships with your grant recipients, with your providers locally, help you understand what it is they're doing to help you get the right project set up. Uh, looking at ESG, Emergency Solutions Grant. So we've got the program components here, street outreach, emergency shelter, prevention, and rapid rehousing. Um, couple notes on Emergency Solutions Grant. We get this question a lot in ESG. There is no such thing as a standalone supportive services project for ESG. You should not be setting up a services only project for ESG. And you may say to yourself, but I have case managers. It's a services only project working in the shelter. Cool, use the shelter project. <laughs> Don't set up a separate services only. Well, what if these case managers travel from this shelter to that shelter to this shelter? Well, then all three of those shelters get reported on for the CAPER. A dollar into a shelter means every single person in that shelter gets reported on in a CAPER. So you don't have to try to like divvy up separate programs, separate projects, have one that serves blue haired people and one that serves green haired people all in one, one shelter project. And it all goes into the caper. Uh, day shelters are uh, supposed to be set up like an entry exit shelter. So that's a common question we get. Some folks think it should be more like a night by night, but HUD has considered that question several times and it is an entry exit set up. So just plugging that one. And then the last one I want to say about ESG is there should not be a standalone coordinated entry project funded by ESG. So you can perform coordinated entry activities as part of one of these components. So a street outreach worker may be doing assessments, a street outreach worker may be doing, or a shelter worker may be doing assessments and referrals. Cool. Collect that data in the context of those projects. So these are the allowable project types for ESG. Um, on the topic of HOPWA, uh, you'll see here there are lots of different program components here for HOPWA and the HMIS project type. Um, and again, you may be saying to yourself, does HOPWA have to be in HMIS? Uh, formula grants do not have to be in HMIS. They are encouraged to participate in HMIS. Uh, it would be the competitive grants that are serving or targeting people experiencing homelessness. Those should be in HMIS. Uh, we don't have programming specs for the <laughs> report. I'm like reading your minds. Um, we don't have programming specs yet, but hopefully at some point in the future, we can get to that place to be able to pull reports out of HMIS for the HOPWA program. That's all I want to say about that. Uh, runway Homeless Youth Program. Uh, so again, we've got the program components here on the left and the project types on the right. Just a special note here. Um, there's three, they're split out on this slide is three, but there's a singular basic center program, right? One BCP that can be either a prevention project or a shelter project. So um, that's an important one to keep in mind too, as you're doing your reporting for RIE, uh, it will need to be the right project type. So be sure that you've got either a prevention or an emergency shelter project set up. And they do offer, um, or they do operate host home shelter projects, which you would set up like an entry exit shelter. Uh, we've got PATH here. Um, the important thing with PATH to keep in mind, because they can have a street outreach project or a supportive services project. And what's important to keep in mind with PATH is where is that person uh, residing? And that will help determine what kind of project you're setting up. So if you have a street outreach project, that is a project designed to assist people who are residing on the street or in a place not meant for habitation. Whereas if you have a supportive services project, uh, that is targeting people who are residing in a placement for habitation, like a shelter. Sometimes we say in reach, that would be a supportive services project, but otherwise it would be a street outreach project. Um, moving on to the VA, again, we have lots of different projects here under the VA's components. Uh, so under SSVF in particular, just highlighting that one, um, there is only SSVF. Like if you look at the funding sources in the data standards, they don't break it out as SSVF rapid rehousing and SSVF homelessness prevention. Um, there is only one funded component of SSVF, but it is important to keep in mind that you either are rapid rehousing or you are homelessness prevention. You may not be both. Projects in HMIS can only have one type. 
Ryan, did you want to do this? I think you were going to do this. We can do it. Why don't you grab? Okay. So let's take a little pause here for a knowledge check. Uh, which of the following examples is not a valid project type combination? Uh, is it the first one where you've got a Rye street outreach project? Would you set it up as a street outreach project? Number two, uh, COC supportive services only, having a COC, or I'm sorry, having a services only project type. Uh, again, supportive services only under the COC program. Can you set up a street outreach project? Can you do street outreach, um, ESG street outreach in a services only project or street outreach in a street outreach project? So show me your fingers. Which one do you think is incorrect? Perfect. Knew you would get it. Well done. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Ryan to talk about um, project descriptor data elements. Thanks, Meredith. So here's a live look in of my uh, living room with my kids <laughs> playing with Legos. No, I just um, PDDEs. Here's an acronym. We'll break it down. Project descriptor data elements. These are very much the foundational building blocks of pretty much everything that we would expect to do in HMIS. Everything from uh, generating by name lists to looking at how long do clients stay in emergency shelter to all of the reports, system performance measures, longitudinal systems analysis, and the APRs and CAPERS, which now we can refer to as by their acronym. <laughs> Thanks, Meredith. Um, so these PDDEs, they really ensure that the project is set up uh, to accurate accurately report based on the project type and the funding sources. So a lot of HMIS leads also wearing other hats by way of system administrators, uh, coordinated entry leads, HMIS trainers. So kind of we know we know kind of the demands of, of doing this and making sure it's communicated clearly to our HMIS end users. But uh, the HMIS lead agency really it's it's critical that they are ensuring um, that the HMIS includes these project descriptor data elements for all continuum projects, regardless of their participation in HMIS. You're saying, Ryan, why do I want to put in projects into HMIS if they're not contributing data? Great question. Great question. It's really critical for generating things like the housing inventory count. It's, it's really helpful for looking at utilization, really helpful for looking at things like um, uh, HMIS coverage, bed coverage, HMIS participation, and all of our other corresponding uh, uh, federal reports. So really critical, even if a project is not contributing data to HMIS, they're still set up. We know kind of how to account for them uh, and, and making sure that we uh, know kind of the breadth and depth of our continuum. So within every continuum project, we have to have our project set up in HMIS uh, and within the project set up for any project that receives funding um, from any of the HMIS federal partner. Uh, again, there's funding components. Uh, they should be consistent with the HMIS data standards manual and any applicable HMIS manual. So we have our ESG manual, our COC manual, we have VA data manuals and, and on and on down the list. So making sure that you're all aware of what guidance exists also making sure that the consistency is really uh, elevated in this discussion and uh, making sure that things are as standard and, and consistent as possible. So some PD, PDDE basics. Uh, relationships are key. Um, not going to ask by show of hands like what your COC looks like or how many participating projects you have or how much funding comes in, but we know uh, COCs really kind of run the gamut, very large, very complex, maybe, uh, you know, thinking of Los Angeles County, for instance, uh, my home hometown of uh, Allegheny County, uh, in Pittsburgh, you know, a, a somewhat more straightforward, we have COCs of all shapes and sizes, all different types of project setups. For the last several years, COCs have been kind of planning to what what should we do with our system? What should we do with our resources? We have some communities very, very heavy on PSH. We have some communities that um, have invested more, you know, over the years in emergency shelter. So what our system actually looks like is going to be actually the, the result of a lot of years of planning, funding, and, and those corresponding decision-making processes. So all that is to say is relationships with your key stakeholders are super critical. They're very, very important to understanding what we are setting up by way of our, our PDDEs and setting up our projects in HMIS. You know, even within our emergency shelter component, we have entry exit night by night different types of projects looking and feeling a little bit differently. It might be a requirement of their funding source or their funder and their grants. Uh, it might just be something that over the years, that's kind of the service delivery model that they've adopted to. They've trained their staff on it um, and, and some, other, uh, some other issues regarding uh, just what does the service actually look like. 
So we as HMIS leads and system administrators, we really need to be kind of in a position to do some of the translating, translation of our, you know, pretty technical uh, HMIS lingo or HMIS guidance into something that, you know, what would make sense if I'm a case manager? I use HMIS as an end user to kind of track participant progress. I'm, you know, maybe using it for case notes, but to the extent that I'm an HMIS end user and I have a really detailed understanding of project descriptor data elements or maybe some definitional nuances around your program specific data elements might not be there, right? So many of the folks in this room who raised your hands that your HMIS leads and sysadmins also raised your hands that your trainers. Training is really, really important. So we wanna make sure all these corresponding pieces are being tied together as consistently and frequently as possible. So what that means in practice, you know, review project grants and scopes of work, really get a, a feel and a good understanding of what your projects um, have been funded to do, what are they required to do, and then what do they actually look like in operation, in impl implementation. How are the services being delivered? Where are the vouchers? Is it facility-based? Is it scattered site? All these different pieces that actually are really critical to describing what the project uh, does by way of service delivery. We want to know that up front when we're setting up the project in HMIS. So now we're going to run through, I was going to say quick, but I can't promise that. We're going to run through the PDDEs. Um, I didn't start, when we were pre prepping this session, I did not have a favorite PDDE. And now that we're delivering the session, I actually do. It's not this one, it's the next one. Um, but it's, or, so we're going to start with 201, organization information. This is a pretty straightforward, unique ID of the organization that operates one or more projects. Earlier in the presentation, uh, Meredith talked about the program and then the projects and then the components. We have a tendency in the field to kind of conflate these terms. In this instance, we mean very specifically the organization and the project. So that project is what the, what the funder has funded the project to do. And then the project descriptor is what does that project actually look like in operation? So all the way at the beginning, we're setting up an organizational information. This is uh, Ryan's Family Shelter. That's my organization. That may or may not be my common name or might be my legal name. HUD gives us as sysadmins and HMIS leads flexibility to kind of make sure that this information uh, is, is communicated to our HMIS end users um, and that we're typing, project typing our, our, our projects as clearly and accurately as possible. So uh, organizations often uh, operate more than one project. So this is a uh, one to many relationship from 201 to 202, which is our project descriptor, but one organization uh, operating one or more projects. So as HMIS leads, some of our expected responsibilities or roles and responsibilities might be uh, activating and deactivating organizations based on the projects they're operating. Again, Meredith mentioned uh, Safe Haven is kind of a legacy, so HUD's not funding new Safe Haven projects. We know there's a smattering of communities across the country that still have these Safe Haven project types. So understanding what, what our system is actually made up of is, is really, really critical. Uh, as HMS leads, we would be managing project and grant transfers when changing organizations. This happens from time to time, but it definitely is an occurrence that we, we need to account for. And then also reporting on the organization's legal name while we might be tracking a, a more commonly known name, you know, nomenclature that's more commonly understood uh, by the community. All right, my favorite PDDE, project information. So what this one does is uniquely identify every project based on a combination of lodging and or services that's being provided. We mentioned this a couple of times already throughout the session. We'll mention it a few more times because it's so, so, so important that only one project uh, is typed per project, right? So we don't wanna have, um, I don't know, a Frankenstein project that's trying to do a lot of different things and we just call it a single project at one point in time. One project type per project, if that means uh, disentangling services from uh, rental assistance, then that's a decision we might need to make locally, again, based on our funding uh, requirements and how the project is actually stood up to deliver services. This data element, the PDDP, and I would say by the end of the session correctly, PDDE, tracks the operating uh, start and end dates. Uh, sometimes we have services only projects as well. And then we'll, this element gives us the opportunity to affiliate those with uh, residential and lodging projects. And it also provides kind of like this spatial physical project description. Uh, it also describes target populations. Do we have uh, uh, a number of projects um, or is this project dedicated to a specific sub, uh, subpopulation type? And then the physical spatial piece is just kind of like where, where is the resource located? Is it all in a single facility? Is it scattered site? 
Um, so really trying to describe as precisely as possible in operation, what is this project doing? What has it been funded to do? Where do the resources come from? Is it both uh, services and rental assistance, or is it one, one or the other? Um, so a lot of things going on in this single data element, but more than any of the other PDDEs, this really describes for us as HMIS leads, what is the project meant to do? Who is it serving? How has it been funded? What is it doing? So um, this also, I think, is really, really critical. It ties a lot of the uh, PDDEs together. It ties our project descriptors across our PDDEs. It links participants to their enrollment in the project. So a common pathway out of homelessness might be street outreach to emergency shelter to rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing. Within this element, we understand um, really what those uh, what that trajectory starts to look like by way of somebody's enrollment in multiple projects in their journey out of homelessness into permanency. And then this uh, on that same point, really critical to link uh, to link project outcomes to system performance. As HMIS leads and system administrators, we're re really looking to make sure that we're confirming uh, operations and service areas with funding requirements later on in the session. Meredith and Sam will talk about sort of multiple funding sources. We get really messy, really complicated, really quickly. This is just, again, the, the foundational piece of what our PDDEs are. Can I jump in real fast? Um, we didn't mention the elephant in the room, uh, that the data standards are being updated in a few months, um, <laughs> which I know we're going to talk more about some of the specifics of it, but 2.02 made me think of it because that's one of the ones that will yes. see a fair number of changes. So I know I've probably, you've heard me say this already for the last couple of months, but I just wanted to flag again, we are going to talk a little bit more in detail about some of the changes, but I just wanted to flag like, yes, we acknowledge that is a change, even though we didn't fully say it right there, but the, these data standards are still in effect through September. So keep that in mind. No, great call. Uh, so the next one, uh, COC information, this is just associating a project with a given COC. Um, a lot of times, especially in the VA space, uh, SSVF providers, their, their catchment area, the areas that they're funded to serve, don't map, oh, pardon me, don't map neatly onto our COC location. So they have multiple COCs that they're expected to serve. The COC information starts to make, uh, make sense of the different geographies uh, and different expectations of funders. As HMIS leads, uh, we want to make sure that we're confirming project op operations with service areas. There's also a helpful relationship, uh, yeah, between 203 and 3.16. 3.16 is currently and until October 1st called client location, after which it will be called enrollment COC, which is really just meant to say we're not looking at a precise address of where this client is. We want to make sure that we're mapping this client, this program participant, this household to the right COC for reporting purposes. This example here is pretty straightforward, but this is something we might see where we have let's say a large urban continuum of care with a small geographic footprint, a lot of participants who are served in a rapid housing uh, project, for instance, end up finding housing outside of the COC's boundaries. So this is basically describing how would you report that instance in HMIS. So we started with COCB, they get the funding, they're uh, providing information in HMIS, that's where the uh, the project is, is funded to serve. Because of the housing market, all these other dynamics, client choice, uh, that client ends up going to uh, the corresponding, the neighboring COC. We will still want to make sure all that information is tied back to the project that is funded uh, to provide housing and services to that person based on all of our PDDEs and the COC uh, funding uh, information. So uh, we see 2.03 uh, other PDDEs, they get pulled into uh, some of our other universal data elements from time to time, but just making sure we have a good understanding of when we should be, you know, what would be a red flag or what would not be a red flag. This is not a red flag, but it's a pretty common instance that that we do see happen, uh, again, just based on project types and, and housing, uh, housing locations. 2.06 is our funding source. This associates a project with all grants and funding sources that support a project. Uh, there's usually a many to one relationship between funding sources and projects. Some projects are self sustaining, kind of self operating based on a single funding source with recent stimulus funding. We know a lot of communities have been trying to piece together, you know, kind of a project that has maximum impact. Sometimes it's blending funding sources 
in a, uh, in a project to do services with one funding stream, provide rental assistance subsidies with another. That's probably the most common instance, but um, absolutely can provide, um, you should be documenting and setting up all of the available funding sources that support a given project. Meredith mentioned this again, kind of will we'll hit the point home. Many projects, especially those emergency shelters, they do operate with multiple funding sources to support operations. Shelter, um, we'll, we'll highlight this point again, but just by way of how you would report on all of those clients for all funding sources, you know, state funded ESG CV and local funded ESG CV supporting shelter operations, report all of those clients back up to both funders is a pretty common, uh, common occurrence that we're seeing. Uh, HMI's lead responsibilities, so we would be setting up the funding source at initial project setup, and we would be reviewing and updating those as often as needed, no less than annually, more frequently, uh, if possible. Uh, mentioned ESG CV, we're in, what, year three of its funding availability. A lot of communities do have grants that are set to wind down and expire uh, sometime this year or sometime next year. So these are things by way of uh, grant closeout and and project uh, project association and PDDEs that we should start uh, start to be thinking about. Two point oh seven. This is the last of our current PDDEs. Two more upcoming and new PDDEs to talk about. Um, if you, I, there's a time later today that I'll be at the AAQ desk with my colleague Janelle Denzin to talk specifically about bed and unit inventory. So come see me then. Uh, if we have any BUI uh, outstanding questions. But this is really meant to report beds and units across uh, many dimensions, right? So thinking about availability of inventory, it's sometimes, it's not always. How far back does it go? How recent is the funding source? Uh, are, we, are we project typing it by uh, household types, adults with children, adult-only households, uh, things like that? dedicated subpopulation types. We have a lot of uh, beds and units that have been set aside for you know, people experiencing chronically homeless, uh, veterans who are experiencing homelessness. So making sure that this is documented here. Also seasonal availability, right? So we have uh, warm weather, cold weather shelters, think about overflow, think about seasonality of a, particularly at the shelter projects. Uh, when are those beds available for how often, under what circumstances? And then also a bit of like sort of spatial mapping, geocodes, zip codes, things like that available within the bed and unit inventory. Um, don't ask us how to define a bed or a unit. Those are really interesting conversations if you ever happen to be a part of those. Uh, they get surprisingly philosophical pretty quickly. Um, back to bed and unit inventory, uh, critical for all of our reports, right? Uh, we know that the LSA is pulling from uh, our inventory count the last uh, last week of each quarter. And then as HMIS leads, we're expecting you know some of our primary roles and responsibilities to be reviewing and updating uh, no less than annually, again, more frequently if, if changes are, are requiring more frequent changes uh, to uh, significant changes. Sorry, I used the word change too much there. Things don't need to change that much. We want to have a good, close, accurate lens on what our bed and unit inventory is. I think Sam will talk later in the session about what constitutes a significant change. When should we really be updating our bed and unit inventory? And then uh, in addition, setting up our, unit, uh, our inventory at initial project setup. Okay, two upcoming changes uh, from a lot of folks in the field, a lot of system administrator calls um, over the past couple of months, we've heard that the current way of managing project participation in HMIS is probably less than ideal. Juice might not be worth the squeeze. It seems to take a lot of effort to close a project if they stop participating in HMIS. So HUD is pushing out a new PDDE called HMIS participation status. This is gonna track HMIS participation or participation in a comparable, comparable database over time with our start and end dates. So for some reason, a shelter, you know, might have a, a change in leadership and they decide that uh, participation in HMIS is not their top priority. We can toggle and toggle the fields on and off, essentially start new, uh, uh, create new exit and start dates based on that project's participation in HMIS. So really trying to make we're reporting on the same types of information, but in a simpler, more streamlined fashion. So making sure that we're uh, getting getting rid of the need to start and end projects simply based on their participation in uh, in HMIS. So what we would expect uh, from HMIS leads and system administrators moving forward, do the same thing as we've been talking about, set up participation status, add initial project setup, and then making sure that as participation might, uh, might change, uh, that, that we're accurately updating this data element. And then also, fun and exciting, 
coordinated entry participation status. Uh, we know that there, um, you know, we we trust that communities have been working to refine their coordinated entry processes. We know that no no process, no workflow, no coordinated entry system uh, is going to be the same from one community to the next. You've all been making a lot of informed decisions around kind of how to how to right size, you know, all of the 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 process flow, the workflow, the phases of assessment, the referral components. What this is intended to do is flow through some of our other program specific data elements to really record a project's role in the coordinated entry process. So defining it by access point, prevention assessment, screening or referral, also a crisis housing assessment, and then the more kind of permanent facing uh, housing needs assessment, vulnerability prioritization, direct service provision. So this would be a multiple select. We know the same project could be doing uh, uh, multiple pieces or contributing uh, across different phases or stages of coordinated entry, making sure that this is providing you with a, as much information or providing you with the structure to try to manage coordinated entry participation uh, in a new and different, hopefully value added way. Can I, I'm sorry, again, interrupt real fast on that one. Uh, two things. One, I saw folks taking pictures of the slides, which fine, that's cool. Um, but note, like, they're not final until they're final. So wait until, uh, you know, May before you start quoting some of our slides here, because I've already noticing like, oh, I think we might have tweaked that just a little bit. Um, so just keep that in mind. Secondly, on the CE participation status, I also just wanted to add that we're also recording information about projects that are receiving referrals. So a lot of what Ryan's talking about is the uh, making of referrals, right, an access point, but we're also tracking the receiving of referrals. So I just wanted to point that out. I'll stop interrupting. Thank you. Yeah. We'll go deeper into uh, some of these common issues throughout the course of our session, uh, multiple funding sources. This is a pretty, you know, it's a common and also can get tricky circumstance pretty, you know, pretty quickly. Super helpful HMIS project setup tool that is used to determine if that funding source either can be combined into a single project in, in HMIS or if your project type is allowable to be funded by, by that funding source as well. So I know a lot of folks kind of raised your hands uh, when we're talking about like, how long have you been in this role? If you're not familiar with this tool, uh, we link through it in the deck, not super helpful right now. You can at least see the URL, make sure that all the information is available to you uh, coming out of you know today. So this would be the most, you know, what I think is one of the more common examples we've heard uh, happening a lot over the past year or two with the uh, introduction of EHV resources, you know, those don't come necessarily with a lot of services attached to them. There are some fees, there's very, very light touch uh, housing, um, housing support that comes along uh, at the front end, but not ongoing supportive services to help a program participant uh, maintain, retain their housing. So a lot of communities have been uh, kind of putting in parallel a housing subsidy resource from EHV, as well as a supportive service uh, component that's funded through COC Repertory Housing. For instance, locally, you have uh, at least two determinations or two ways of going about making this project work and setting it up and typing it in HMIS. You can create one project that is shared by both providers, providers being the, the service provider and the rental assistance provider, or it could be uh, two separate projects setting them up because they're doing different things, right? Paying financial assistance and ongoing rental subsidy, very different than providing supportive services. So very common issue, wanted to highlight it here. Um, also ESG for shelter, the $1 kind of rule. So we know that there's a lot of demands placed on our emergency shelter providers. Typically they're underfunded when there is funding coming into them. It's typically coming from multiple uh, funding streams. Um, so making sure that we understand when HUD ESG emergency solutions grant is used to support shelter operations, how to account for all of those participants that are also being supported by other funding streams. Tips and tricks, again, more than anything, maintain good working relationships, ask the right questions, ask questions um, that, that might not be clear to you about the grant requirements around the organizational uh, organization's you know, program design. We see, I don't know, 30, what is it, Baskin Robbins, 36 flavors, probably 36 variations of rapid rehousing uh, service delivery, right? Everything from kind of short-term rental assistance, uh, short-term, you know, one month or more, medium-term rental assistance, three to 24 months. You know, it, there's a lot of different takes on how to provide a service, a lot of different decisions, like I mentioned, that communities have made to kind of right-size their, their project. How we type that and tie it back to our PDDEs uh, is really, really critical. 
Um, ask questions. Has the project been implemented? What are the core services? Are you partnering with a service provider and you're the primary payer of rental assistance? What is the service area or the catchment area for the project? Are we looking at one single COC or multiple COCs? A lot of questions to be asking, things that we can do, again, just by way of building the relationship with our service providers. You know, share what you're seeing in the data. We didn't expect this shelter to have uh, a voucher because we didn't know you were paying for hotel motel assistance. Is that actually a thing that's happening, right? These types of questions are really, really key, really, really critical. It makes it known that you're available to answer and work through these questions. It also makes sure that you're getting the right amount of information from the right source who can really make sure that um, they're, they're a partner with you in, in typing uh, and setting up these HMIS projects. Eva, quick show of hands, who's familiar with the Eva data quality tool? Couple, make sure you get your hexagonal stickers. I was told the hexagon actually means something. So uh, yeah, if you do projects in R, right? Yeah, okay, <laughs> What? it's pretty cool. Get your EVA stickers, go explore EVA as well, uh, has a PDDE checker, again, along with the uh, HMIS project setup tool. We'll save q and I know questions are probably piling up. I'm not as quite as good of a mind reader as Meredith, so I'm not sure what you're thinking, but I'll turn things back over to Meredith. Keep writing down your questions. We'll make sure we have time uh, towards the end. Thanks, Ryan. And I did just, I was not like texting or something. I was looking at the Whova app and I saw that there was at least one question in there too. So we'll we'll circle into that and, and get those questions too. Um, I'm only going to talk for a second here about common project setup challenges. Um, as you can see here, and we sort of hit on some of them a little bit. We're going to dive a little deeper here though. Um, joint component is one. We get a lot of questions about joint component, multiple, multiple funding sources, multiple subrecipients. Uh, reporting, project closures, consolidations, and transfers, also a hot topic. Uh, Non-HMIS participating providers, namely victim service providers, um, new and demo funding sources, and inventory tracking. So let's start with my personal favorite of joint component. Um, <laughs> there was sarcasm in there. Um, uh, the, so the joint component projects is a little cumbersome. We're just going to own that. Uh, it is two different components, right? It is uh, permanent housing and it is transitional housing that we have mushed together into a single project. When uh, an organization, when an agency is operating a joint component project, there must be two projects set up in the HMIS. There must be a transitional housing project. There must be a rapid rehousing project. A client must be enrolled into both projects. We're going to walk through that in just a second. We're going to dig a little deeper into client data collection here just to drive this point home. When it comes to reporting on a joint component project and you go to do your APR in SAGE, SAGE is going to ask for two uploads. You must be able to upload a transitional housing APR and a rapid rehousing APR, at least one of each. It is entirely possible that you might have two rapid rehousing projects to one TH project. That's much like our Baskin Robbins example here, right? Like people do all sorts of different things and you do what works in your community and that's fine, that's great for you, but we have to have at least one TH and at least one rapid rehousing, one RRH. So let's talk a little bit about client enrollments because we get this question a lot. Um, those of you that are YHDP funded, we'll talk to you specifically here in a few minutes because this we run afoul of this in YHDP a lot. This is um, the example, client enrollments here. This is what, generally speaking, the vast majority of the client enrollments we would expect to look like. You go into the TH project and you go into the rapid rehousing project on the exact same day. So you move into your transitional housing unit. The person moves into their unit. They have a project start date set as that first day they moved in. They also have a project start date set up in the rapid rehousing project and enrollment, if you will, in, on that exact same date. You're gonna record the same information in both projects. I'm sorry. The enrollment continues in both projects until such time that person moves into their permanent housing unit. So they may stay in that transitional housing project for a year. They may stay there for two years. I think most of the time we're seeing people there for a short period of time, right? Like it is a brief transition into uh, out of homelessness and while they're working their way into their new permanent unit. 
Um, but whatever that time period is, they are open in both projects for the duration. At the point at which they move out of their transitional housing unit and move into their rapid rehousing unit, then you exit them from the transitional housing project and you set their housing move-in date on the same day. So once that TH, once they're gone from the TH project, cool. Don't have to do anything else with that enrollment. Now you're just recording everything in the rapid rehousing project. But there do have to be those two for that overlap for that period of time, two. Now we may also see situations, again, less common, but it happens, where they're enrolling or engaging in the rapid rehousing project first. They are admitted to the rapid rehousing project before they move into their apartment or their transitional unit, excuse me. So it is possible that you would have a rapid rehousing project start date before they actually moved into the TH unit. But at the point they moved into the TH unit, then you enroll them into the TH project and the rest of their time, they would have two enrollments. It's possible that they uh, move out of the TH project and don't move into rapid rehousing. Uh, you could exit them or you could um, record their housing move-in date at the point that they are no longer in the transitional project and only in the apartment supported by the rapid rehousing project. This is all written down in a document that we again have a link to. All these pictures, all the stuff, if you haven't seen it yet, can't think of what it's called off the top of my head. Something rapid rehousing and transitional housing data collection. But um, we've got this all written down for you to look at. Um, not just for you guys to know, for your agencies to know. That's where the disconnect seems to be happening because I see a lot of heads nodding. I know you guys have heard a lot of this. You know a lot of this. But when it comes time for that agency to do their APR, not working. They don't have, they're like, what? We're supposed to have two? No, I didn't do two. Why would I do two? You know, so there's all of this miscommunication and confusion happening at the project level. So take back what, what you're hearing today, take that to your organizations. The last point I wanted to talk on with this one is people that come and go, right? This is also another thing that happens where someone may have been, um, they had their two enrollments here in the TH and the RRH project. They moved out of TH, moved into their apartment. Everything's great. Oh, wait, then they became homeless again and they lost that housing. They ended up back in a shelter, but they're still in the project. Let's start this process back over. We're going to start back over with the TH and the RRH enrollments and go through the same process again. So at the point, maybe they unfortunately stay on the streets for a few weeks or stay in a shelter for however long. At the point they move back into their transitional housing unit, then you start the process back over and you re-enroll them in both projects. So just wanted to take a minute on that. Again, the links to the, the guidance are in here. Um, I strongly encourage you to digest this yourself and then translate it to your people in a language that you all speak so that they understand that they have to do two enrollments, that the agencies and the organizations understand the, the requirements of these projects. Uh, Sam, I'm gonna turn it over to you, talk about funding sources. Okay, so this is something that um, Ryan was talking about earlier. So multiple funding sources. So there's kind of like different scenarios in which you can have multiple funding sources. The first one that we're going to be talking about on this slide is if it's multiple funding sources in the same project serving the same client. So this is kind of what we were talking about, like an emergency shelter would have funding from different sources, but we're not necessarily like splitting out that funding into these people are getting this funding and these people, everybody's getting that combination of funding. Um, you're going to see, we have again, referenced the HMIS project setup tool. This is a really important tool. That's why it keeps getting referenced. It's really useful for things like this, but it can be used to determine if funding sources can be combined to a single project in HMIS. So I, for this example, like, for example, maybe like you have a youth shelter that's being funded by both ESG and RI, that can be made into one project into HMIS, and then you would have the two separate funding sources listed in the project set up in their project, project information section. And then all you would have to do is make sure that you have the correct project type in the setup so that end users are actually able to see the correct data elements that they're supposed to be able to see that, so that the reporting is as smooth as possible for when they have to do it. And then um, we have multiple funding sources for different eligible activities. So um, for example, actually, I'm going to go to the next slide. 
So let's say um, there's two different ways to set up these kinds of projects. It can be a single project where the project type will be the appropriate residential project type. And then the funder program component will identify both funding sources and comp component types for that project or into two separate projects where you have a housing project that has the residential project type appropriate to the grant and then a services project that will have that services only as this project type and then um, that question if the services only project is affiliated with a res residential project you would put that as yes if they are indeed affiliated so this is important for things actually I think we have it in I'm going to go quickly to the knowledge check. So this is one of the examples that we have. So we have a youth serving agency that has two grants through YHDP. One is the services only street outreach, and then one is the standalone services. So the agency plans to conduct street outreach, outreach activities to assist youth residing in camps with getting into shelter and or housing. But the age, And the agency also plans to provide educational assistance to youth experiencing homelessness to connect or to connect youth with assistance to complete their GED. And this is kind of getting to that question. Can these projects be combined into a single project in the HMIS? Um, if I can see fingers about what y'all are thinking. <laughs> um. <laughs> so um, what I would say in this situation is I would actually probably say no, because it really depends on, um, because these are kind of, two separate things that they're being funded to do. But of course, if there, if you think that you have a very, very a specific situation where these can be combined into a single project to HMIS, don't hesitate to uh, ask the, or ask a question, send a question in through the AAQ, um, and then we can talk through that. To be clear though on this one, it is a hard no, because you have two different grants, one that is a street outreach grant and one that is a standalone services grant. So they're funded to provide different activities. They're doing different projects. So they're, when you go to like submit a report, not to like make everything about Sage, but that's my comfort zone. You go to report in Sage, Sage wants to see a street outreach APR and a services only APR. So you cannot combine the two into a single project type. You only can have one project type per HMIS project, right? So um, keep that in mind. I think to the point though, Sam's making about the project setup tool, there are definitely times where we think um, like local customization, local software can do different things than what the project setup tool does. So like, if you think you can make that work in your HMIS, submit an AAQ and we can work that through with you. But um, in this specific example, it would definitely be a, a no. Yeah. And I think to that, that um, that is a good point that like some of these, the, the reasons that we're setting up these projects into two separate projects, a lot of it is in reporting because we want to make sure that um, that we understand what the money is actually being used for and how many clients you're serving and all of that things that grant grantors require of you. Um, you need to be able to report that out. And these HMIS project setup guidance is to make that as easy for the people reporting as possible. And then um, these are other examples of when um, you would be creating multiple projects in HMIS for something that appears to be one project on the ground. One that is not in the slide but has already been mentioned is the THRRH, the joint TH and RH. Those are two separate projects, even if it looks like just one project. Here's one that says one residential building that has two different project types. So maybe they're, um, they are serving clients that are in an emergency shelter, but also they also have emergency shelter and TH beds, but they also have permanent supportive housing, uh, or sorry, emergency shelter beds and TH beds, or maybe a building that has permanent supportive housing, but also permanent housing where there's no disability required beds. Um, projects that provide both homeless prevention and rapid rehousing, you do have to separate those out into separate projects. Um, PH projects that are created with a variety of rental subsidies, and organizations that receive PATH funding for both street outreach services and supportive services to persons at risk, which we talked about earlier as well. And then um, just something else to think about, multiple subrecipients. So if you're setting up multiple subrecipients, just make sure that your HMIS is set up in a way that the recipient is able to get all of the information that they need for reporting. So that's either setting up your HMIS privacy settings so that the recipient can get all of that information in all of your different project setups and submit it into reporting, 
or if you're going to have to have the sysadmin run it because they're the only ones that have the actual um, security clearance to do that, then um, just make sure you have that set up in your system as well. And multiple COCs, we talked about this a little bit earlier. Um, sometimes uh, if you have like a tenant-based voucher program where the voucher is issued from one COC, but the client uses the voucher in another COC, that data is recorded in the original COC that provided that voucher. And there's also um, different projects that provide lodging or services across a geographic area. Again, we talked about it already, like VA-funded SSVF projects. So if you have a funding recipient that is expected to participate in each of the COCs, HMIS, just make sure that um, these agreements are all kind of set up. It's either they are doing direct data entry into all of the HMIS, so they have HMIS projects set up into all of the um, COCs that they're working in, or there is a data entry into a single HMIS and they would be providing client level data exports to the other HMISs that um, they're also kind of, they're, they're also providing services in. So this is kind of complicated. It has a lot to do with working with all of the COCs, working together with uh, SSVF, the VA, and just making sure that all of that data gets reported um, as needed. Okay, and then I'm gonna pass it off to Ryan. Thanks again, Sam. We are okay on time, but our session is uh, is going by pretty quickly. So I'm going to zip through the next couple of slides. We'll make sure we save time for questions and answers. Um, so just a quick note on project closure. Again, the, the uh, project closures, consolidations, transfers, really great and helpful document in terms of how to treat these, uh, these scenarios. Are you uh, consolidating two projects into a single one? Are you closing one project, maintaining the operation of another project? Usually locally determine uh, decisions, but want to make sure that you know, you know, based on the option, based on the choice that is chosen, how to actually go about uh, managing that client data in any given project. Should we close it or consolidate it or transfer uh, program participants from one project to another? Comparable databases. I know we kind of sit in this uh, kind of funny space, right? We have a lot of victim service providers doing really critical and important work. Uh, as HMIS leads, we may or may not be kind of closely connected to, to some of the work that's happening by way of comparable databases. Wanted to touch really, really briefly on just some comparable database, uh, what's been called a comparable database strategy. HUD for the past couple of months has been starting to message this through our sysadmin calls and some other forums just around what are the requirements of, of a comparable database. So making sure that it's compliant with HUD data and technical standards. We have our PDDEs, our UDEs, universal data elements, as well as any program sp specific data elements required to meet the reporting needs of our funders, uh, RIE, PATH, VA, others come to mind. Um, and also, you know, meet the standards set out in the data dictionary by way of dependent fields, generating a HUD standard, a HUD defined standard uh, for um, security, privacy, software functionality, and data quality. Uh, comparable database must be able to generate a CSV for the CAPER and a CSV APR report, right? So those are really, really critical uh, uh, project level reports. Um, making sure that the, the comparable database has been programmed in a way that generates a, a fully compliant CSV is a requirement, a standard of, of a comparable database provider. Current data elements, again, these will be changing in the next couple of months, but under the 2022 uh, fiscal year standards, we still have these in effect for PDDEs, universal data elements, and then uh, PSDEs and our common, uh, common data elements, C1 through 3. Those are required to be programmed, maintained, and updated. Also meet uh, our, our reporting requirements by way of generating a complete and current hashed and unhashed HMIS CSV. Um, still learning about CSV. It's a great document. It's super intricate. <laughs> it might be my new favorite report. Um, so for comparable databases, again, privacy, security, client confidentiality, really, really critical when we're talking about survivors of domestic violence and, and victims fleeing domestic violence situations, making sure that projects are still requiring client level data since it's a comparable database, not our HMIS. That's where the client level data is going. It's not aggregate. It's speaking to uh, the client specific uh, characteristics, again, at the UDE and across our, our other data elements as well. So if you're an ESG or COC funded provider using a comparable database, make sure that we're going all the way back to our PDDEs and project typing uh, in the way that meets the requirements of the funder. 
if the uh, if the project is also receiving uh, federal partner funding, we want to make sure that the specific data element programming, maintenance, and updating is meeting the needs of any of our other funders, Hopwa, Path, or RI, and victim service providers funded by other federal sources that are not COC or ESG must include those data elements uh, for the projects to meet those reporting requirements. Again, so as HMS leads, system administrators spending some time doing a crosswalk of what funding sources uh, are supporting the project, what data elements are required to be made available to the end user so they can go through the data collection process, and then on the back end, populate and submit compliant reports. Decision trees, we love them. We have one for project descriptors. We also have one for, is your uh, database a comparable database? And so really, really helpful um, to pull together the policy, the legal, and the reporting determinations uh, as, a, as a help guide as well. Back to Meredith. So let's talk a little bit about new and demo funding sources. Raise your hand if you have a YHDP grant in your community. Okay. Well, you'll probably get one soon because <laughs> it just seems like the way it is. Um, so Youth Homelessness Demonstration Program has been one that we get um, a ton of questions on about project setup. Um, it is, in general, set up exactly like the COC program. But sometimes when we start uh, using, you know, different words and new innovative ideas and different language for different activities, uh, we get ourselves a little bit confused um, and get off track a little bit in our project setup. So there is a YHDP HMIS manual goes into depth about project setup for YHDP, YHDP funded projects. But I also want to note there are some additional data collection requirements for YHDP projects. So they have to collect the uh, RIE data for sexual orientation. There is a uh, COC program specific data element for education status um, that those also have to be collected. And I want to put my plug out again for training and new user engagement. We have seen in YHCP communities that this is a lot of money, it's a lot of resources, a lot of new organizations coming into the fold that don't have a clue what HMIS is. And we need to train them on how to, A, what is an HMIS, and B, how to use HMIS. Because there is nothing more disappointing than at the end of a program year and we hear from communities and they're like, well, this doesn't show what I did in my project. This, These outcomes don't reflect my project. Oh, well, you didn't. You didn't actually collect anything at program exit, so you have no income or, out, or housing outcomes because everything is data not collected because they didn't know. They didn't know they needed to collect this information at annual assessment. They didn't know that they were being measured on improvements in these different areas. So just putting that plug out there again for YHDP. Um, also noting that there is a um, another funding source uh, that is uh, the ESG Rapid Unsheltered Survivor Program, ESG Rush. It is uh, only available in presidentially declared disaster areas. Uh, there's only been, to my knowledge, one allocation, and it was in Florida after Hurricane Ian in October of 2022. Um, but I wouldn't, I, I think that the anticipation would be that there would likely be more of those. Um, so that may be something that may be impactful to you. So take a look at the ESG manual if you haven't already. And then the special NOFO for unsheltered and rural. Um, there will be more guidance coming on that. Um, you know, again, the, they were awarded in 2020 or early 2023 to 46 different cities and localities across 30 states. So I'm guessing some of y'all this impacts. Um, there will be some data collection and reporting guidance coming out on those programs. So keep an eye out for those on the HUD exchange. The last thing I think I'm going to say um, in this session is around reporting. Always, always, always remember reporting implications. I think Sam has said it, Ryan has said it, I am saying it again. And I like my little graphic here of like errors made here. Sorry, Sam. Can't be fixed down there in reporting. And again, the number of questions we get from folks saying, well, that's not right. We didn't do this. This isn't what we did. This is what we did, you know? And it's it's happening when they're submitting their APRs. It's happening when they're submitting their CAPERS. It's happening when an ESG recipient is saying to their subrecipient, where's the data that you were supposed to collect? And they say, what data? <laughs> so it is happening in lots of different avenues. And so that's where this HMIS setup, your role here is so critical. In, and again, reiterating what Ryan said, like building that relationship, getting to know what projects 
Index or in your COC, what are they doing? What are they trying to do? What do they think they're doing? All of that information so that you're setting up their project in HMIS at the end of the year, then they'll be able to report on their performance and they'll be able to tell the story of what they were able to achieve with their project over the course of the last year. Do we want to pause? Yeah. Because we have a whole HMIS desk on bed and unit inventory, and I think that's what we're getting into. Do you all want to talk about bed and unit inventory, or do you want to ask questions? Does anybody have I think questions? Questions. Yeah. Oh, boo. <laughs> I love talking about bed and unit inventory. Um, so I think, Ryan, you want to run the mic? Is that what you're doing? All right. So we have about 10 minutes, and we won't hold you back from lunch. So break is up next. We are happy to go beyond uh, the next 10 minutes if we need to. Um, hello. Hi. Hi. Um, I guess my the, the one area that I struggle with when it comes to program setup is when a totally different agency inherits a rapid rehousing or a permanent housing program. And the part that I struggle with is the project start date for that program who inherited consumers who already been housed, their move-in date will be prior to this project start date. And what report, there's a report that flags that for me. Uh, thank you, LSA, Re flags that right, for LSA me. doesn't like it. But yeah. <laughs> and um, I, I always took, I always tell, you know, that that's a justification that, that can be entered, but my community doesn't like errors or flags. <laughs> <laughs> if there's we one thing I know about you all is that I don't like errors or flags. <laughs> so, so it's hard to give a single answer because I don't know how you did it. And, it. and this guy here gives multiple different ways for how to handle these grant closures and project transfers. But it's been a minute since I've looked at this, but I, are you familiar with this document? Do we not go into the PDDE considerations in there and say to change different dates for different things? Because I think that that guidance may have that information in it. We use talking to the mic. Thank you. Agency A took over agency B, but everybody in agency B already was moved into housing. So right. their grant closes in SAGE with agency B, mm -hmm. the new grant opens in SAGE with agency A, mm -hmm. with the new grant start date as the operating start date. Could you not set the operating start date to the original operating start date? Can we do that? Yeah. It's really just that easy? Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Love that. <laughs> Unless there's a different flag I'm not aware of that will flag something else, but I hear other people saying yes, which... Well, and see, that's where I'm not sure how you're doing the client transfers. And that makes a difference. Like if you're just changing, there's four different options in there, I think. Um, it, so it just is going to, I think, depend on how you're doing the client transfer. And if you're exiting everyone out, then they're going to have a different start date and a different move-in date and all that sort of stuff. Well, so then all of the dates should move over fine and it shouldn't be an issue. Well, the, the project has been running for a long time. They just took it over. So go back to the original grant start date. The operating start date of that project. Mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, my question is kind of for like everyone, but I wanted to see how common it is for if you're an um, system admin to collect the actual contracts to the subrecipients. Um, we have a project profile set up form currently, but they often are incorrect. So is the question to the group who all collects the contract? Yeah, so that you can review it yourself. So that you can look at it yourself. Does anybody else do that? From your subrecipients, do you ask them for a copy of their contract? I hear and I want to. Who does anyone want to? I see one. It's 
So just reiterating for the benefit of the crowd outside of here, um, sounds like they have a close relationship with their COC and so they do get those subrecipient contracts. It might be, I'm sure that conversation looks and feels different from one community to next, even setting up something like an Excel form where the, the uh, uh, re receiving organization can populate in the, the critical information might be a step in the right direction. I think in one of these sessions on the NHSDC website, there may be a sample template that we have done before. Like someone gave us an example of like a form that they have their um, agencies fill out and give back to them. So if you want to look on the NHSDC website, or I can see if I can find it and link to it somehow in Whova, I think we made a form as an example that might be helpful to folks. Yeah. So they don't know the dates and the grant IDs and we can give her a mic. We can give her a mic. Just so that our friends online can hear you. All right. <laughs> so we've asked our uh, providers to fill up those forms. But most of them, and there are some who really go through the form and actually look into their uh, whatever application they've got, they fill up the correct information. The others are like, we don't know what bed and unit inventory, inventory you're talking about. We don't know what grant ID you want. It's nowhere on the application. I'm like, it's not possible. Something has to be there. And what I end up with five times back and forth is, I put the project ID as the grant ID in there. The start date would be, they have to give me a start date. I've reached a point where I'm like, you have to have to find a start date for me. And if it's a private fund, they're like, there's no start date end date. It goes on forever. But if it's a actual, I leave the private funds. I'm, I'm not bothering them for the private local funds anymore. I wonder if you, eh, maybe this is like wishful thinking, but like if you ask them, when is your report going to be due? And then work back from there. Or, you know, like, do you know when you have to, The, the yes, if it's there yet, it may not be there yet with the point that they're doing the setup in HMIS. Yeah, but the thing they is, may, we know. do have the forms that you're talking about. We do ask our providers to fill up the form. They should do the, they should complete the form the way it is. They don't. Do you do a training for them? For completing the form? Yeah. No, but I practically call them and I tell them. Hey, I wonder if it might not be worth your while to do a training. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what we should start off with now because I do call them immediately. This is missing. This, this, this. Yeah. They're like, okay, we look into it. And they're like, we looked at the entire application. We don't find the grant ID. I yeah. don't know what ID you want. Yeah. And maybe it's the language thing, right? Like, I feel like all of my sessions are blending into one yeah. and not using jargon and inside baseball talk. And, you know, and like, we're not talking about a grant ID that you would have in eSnaps in your application. We're talking about the grant number that's on your contract that's executed by the field office. And maybe they just, you guys are talking past each other and talking, you think you're talking about the same thing and you're both hearing something different. So maybe a training or like a one pager or a crosswalk of definitions or something Mm -hmm. Most of our agencies are getting granted from the county or city. So I'm asking the county or the city to confirm yeah. the project profile information. Yeah, especially with like ESG funds, things like that. Yes. So I had a question about the move-in dates in regards to rapid rehousing. Because um, when I used to work in rapid rehousing, some people would tell us the move-in date is when the client is actually sleeping in their unit. And some would say the move-in date is the least signed date. Um, so normally we would use the lease sign date, but then there's some clients that sign their lease, but they don't, you know, leave the shelter until like mm -hmm. a week later. Mm -hmm. um, so the move-in date would be the day that they're they in go sleep the in their new apartment. Yep. Yeah, because the move-in date is actually to differentiate between clients that are still homeless and but still working with the rapid rehousing project and actually house. So you do have to use that date to identify when the client actually is sleeping in that unit. Yes.
and yet we still find that the housing move in date issue. Yeah. So, yeah. Like she said, uh, we have a lot of PSH rapid rehousing who says, oh, well, they signed the lease on this date, but they still have an open check in or they still physically stand with the emergency shelter. So a lot of the times as the HMIS lead, I'm going back and forth between both programs to say, hey, while I understand what you're saying, that's not the hood definition. So yeah. is that just a conversation that I'm going to just have to get used to having or <laughs> <laughs> just trying to you know, figure it out because it happens a lot. Can I have that other mic? Oh, sorry. We put in very bold letters on our forms. The move-in date is the date the client is physically moving their stuff into their unit and are not going to sleep at the shelter that night. Like we had to break it down just like that because right they're like, well, they signed their lease a month ago. I signed my lease a month ago. I yeah. still didn't move in. Like, so yeah. yeah. And then, and they, you know, what's their motivation for it? I know it, it is time for us to go. Um, I'll finish my thought in a second, but thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you to our online friends and do your um, evaluation in the Whova app. Thank you.